Welcome to the Dead Podcast, where I discuss all things spooky and weird. I'm Desi, and today I'll be talking about the Manger Hotel. Let's get started. Hey everyone, how is everyone doing tonight? I hope y'all are doing good. So tonight is another hotel, and it's another hotel that I got to go and stay at. I just loved it. I also had some drinks at the bar and dinner. I had two different drinks at the bar. One was called a Texas Mule, and that was super good. And then I had the second one, I think it was called a Caribbean Mama or something like that, but that one was really good. I could have drank like 10 of those. So good. And then I just had some nachos. And they were very, very good. And I will post pictures of both of those. So I'm just going to be talking about the hotel, the history behind it, and some encounters there. So let's get started. The Manger Hotel was opened in 1859 by William Manger and his wife, Mary Gunther Manger. William was originally a German immigrant who owned a successful brewery, the first in Texas, which adjoined the hotel. The hotel itself quickly became a popular destination due to its proximity to the Alamo, offering luxury and high-class services to travelers of the time. The beer garden was a hit among locals and visitors alike. This beer garden attracted influential guests and visitors, further cementing the hotel's place in San Antonio's elite circles. The hotel underwent various expansions the first being in 1879, where the hotel's size more than doubled. The Manger's architecture combines southern charm with Victorian elegance, complete with grand arches, columns, and beautifully designed interiors that still preserve the 19th century ambiance. The hotel features a grand central courtyard garden with fountains, tropical plants, and palm trees. This serene garden contrast with the haunting stories that surround the building. The lobby is adorned with marble floors, antique furniture, and period artwork, all reminiscent of the hotel's storied past. Today, it has 316 rooms, each retaining a historical charm while offering modern amenities. The Manger Bar is a replica of the House of Lords pub in England featuring dark wood paneling, large mirrors, and old-fashioned ambiance. The Manger Hotel became a hub for high society and politics during the late 19th century. It attracted famous guests, including military leaders, politicians, and dignitaries, and it was well known for hosting elaborate social events. Today, it's a popular spot for both history buffs and paranormal investigators. The Manger Hotel is located directly adjacent to the Alamo, which played a key role in the Texas Revolution. The proximity to this hallowed ground adds to its hotel's historical significance. Many guests choose to stay at the Manger due to its direct view and access to this crucial landmark. Some even speculate that spirits from the Alamo's battleground may have wandered into the Manger, contributing to the hotel's paranormal activity. The Manger Hotel holds a significant place in American history. It has hosted an impressive list of famous figures, including Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt stayed at the hotel in the late 1890s and often drank and held meetings in the Manger Bar, using it as a recruitment center for his Rough Riders. The Manger Bar remains one of the hotel's most famous spots. Guests have reported sightings of Roosevelt's spirit in the hotel, often around the bar area where he would recruit soldiers for the Spanish-American War. Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general, stayed at the hotel during his military service. During the Civil War, the Manger Hotel played a key role as a hub for Confederate soldiers. The hotel was often filled with 
the soldiers, officers, and military leaders. The Manger even housed Confederate officers, making it a hotbed of military activity. This period in the hotel's history has also been linked to the hauntings experienced by visitors, with some apparitions believed to be Civil War soldiers. Oscar Wilde, the famous writer and poet, also spent time at the Manger during one of his tours in the United States. Sarah Bernhardt, the French actress, often regarded as one of the greatest actresses of the 19th century, was also a guest at the Manger. In addition to Roosevelt and Grant, presidents such as Ulysses S. Grant, William McKinley, Woodrow Wilson, and Dwight D. Eisenhower have stayed at the hotel. Celebrities, authors, and other famous personalities continued to make the Manger Hotel their choice destination. The Manger Hotel is often considered one of the most haunted hotels in America, with over 30 different spirits said to inhibit its halls. Some of the most famous hauntings include the ghost of Sally White. Perhaps the most famous ghost at the Manger Hotel is that of Sally White, a chambermaid who worked at the hotel. In 1876, Sally was brutally murdered by her husband in one of the hotel's rooms. The Manger paid for her funeral costs and she was buried in San Antonio. However, her spirit is said to have never left the hotel. Numerous guests and staff have reported sightings of a maid dressed in an old-fashioned uniform, believed to be Sally walking through the halls or seen carrying towels to rooms. She is said to appear as a full apparition and then vanish when approached. In addition to Sally White, another maid is rumored to haunt the upper floors of the hotel. She is often seen tidying up rooms and then disappearing when guests or staff approach. Some say this apparition is a residual haunting where the maid's spirit continues to perform her duties as she did in life. Another famous ghost is Captain Richard King, the founder of the King Ranch and one of the wealthiest men in Texas history. King was a frequent guest at the Manger Hotel and even had a personal suite. After being diagnosed with cancer, he spent his final days at the Manger Hotel, passing away in 1885 in his suite. His funeral procession passed through the lobby of the hotel. Guests and staff have reported seeing Captain King's spirit, often in the hallway near his old suite. He is typically described as wearing a gray suit and wide-brimmed hat, and he is seen walking through the halls as parts of the building have been remodeled since his time. As previously mentioned, Roosevelt's ghost is said to linger in the hotel, particularly around the bar. Guests have reported seeing his apparition in the Manger Bar, often as a robust, mustachioed figure in late 19th century military attire. Some guests even claim to feel an unseen presence or experience cold spots in the bar area. Another mysterious figure is the Lady in Blue, a ghost frequently spotted in the Victorian wing of the hotel. She is often described as wearing a blue dress and bonnet, wandering through the hallways or gazing out of the windows. She never interacts with guests, but has been seen repeatedly by different visitors over the years. In addition to these specific ghosts, Guests report encountering various unnamed spirits. These include shadowy figures, unexplained noises, cold spots, flickering lights, and objects moving on their own. Some rooms, in particular, are said to be especially active, with guests reporting knocks on the doors, footsteps, or whispers in the night. Paranormal investigators have conducted several studies of the hotel and consistently claim to find evidence of supernatural activity. Teams equipped with EMF meters, EVP recorders, and cameras have explored the property 
claiming to capture mysterious sounds, voices, and images. While the major ghost stories such as those of Sally White, Captain Richard King, and Theodore Roosevelt are well known, there are additional tales of hauntings that add to the Manger Hotel's eerie reputation. Some guests report that room 316 is particularly haunted, with many reporting strange occurrences such as knocking on the walls, whispers, and the feeling of being watched. Some have even experienced the sensation of an unseen presence sitting on the bed next to them, or the feeling of pressure on their chest. Numerous guests and staff have reported sightings of a ghostly Confederate soldier roaming the halls of the Manger. This apparition is often seen in full military uniform, standing still or walking through the hallways, disappearing when approached. Some speculate that he may be one of the soldiers who stayed at the hotel during the Civil War. In addition to the Lady in Blue, another spirit commonly reported is the Lady in White. This ghost is often seen floating near the garden or walking slowly through the halls. Always vanishing before anyone can get too close, the Lady in White has been seen more frequently in the original part of the hotel, suggesting she may be linked to the Manger's earliest days. There have also been reports of a childlike spirit, particularly in the hallways near the Victorian wing. Guests have heard the laughter of a child, the sound of small footsteps running down the hall, and even seen the fleeting figure of a young boy or girl. While there is no known historical account linked to this spirit, some believed it could be connected to one of the families who stayed at the hotel in its earlier years. One of the lesser known ghost stories involves Emma Manger, the daughter of hotel founders William and Mary Manger. Some say that Emma's spirit remains in the hotel, watching over her family's legacy. She is often seen in the upstairs hallways, wearing a long dress and walking silently through the corridors, especially near the older original rooms. Guests have also reported smelling the unmistakable scent of perfume in certain areas of the hotel, particularly where no modern explanation exists. This olfactory phenomenon is often linked to the spirit of former female guests or staff members from the hotel's earlier years, perhaps even Sally White or Mary Manger herself. The Manger's haunted reputation has made it a popular subject for various paranormal television shows, podcasts, and documentaries. Its inclusion in episodes of Ghost Adventures and other ghost hunting shows has helped to increase its fame, drawing more tourists interested in both history and the supernatural. The Manger Hotel is not just a place to stay, it is a living museum filled with history, luxury, and ghosts. Its rich history as a cornerstone of San Antonio's development, its proximity to the Alamo, and its legacy of hauntings make it a truly unique destination. Whether visitors come for its luxurious accommodations, historical tours, or ghostly encounters, the Manger remains an iconic fixture in Texas's cultural landscape, where the past seems to linger in both spirit and architecture. Now I'll be reading to you two supposed encounters at the Manger Hotel. Encounter number one. So people have asked about some of the other encounters I have had, so I figured I would share one of my favorite places, the Manger Hotel in San Antonio, Texas. I'm sure most people that are into ghosts or the paranormal have heard about the Manger Hotel. It has a long history and has seen its fair share of events, so I will not bore you with the history. It doesn't hurt that it is parked next to the Alamo, either. This will be a collection of encounters I have had during my many stays there. 
The story starts off pretty boring. I book there because I went to do a site review for a job and wanted to stay in a haunted hotel, and they said the Manger was the place. Needless to say, the first day didn't produce results, and even the ghost tour was pretty standard, but hey, it was well done and I learned the history. The next trip back was a different story. I booked there again because this time I just liked the hotel and the staff. Checked in and went up to my room, which was located on the Alamo side, unlike the first time. I passed a mirror in the hallway that overlooked the balcony, and on the other side, I saw a woman dressed in period clothing. At first, I thought it was one of the ghost tour ladies, because that's how they dressed. But by the time I wiped my head around to look at her, there wasn't anyone there. I shook my head. I thought I was overlaying the painting from downstairs in my head. However, when I got closer to my room door, there is another mirror at the end of the hallway, and I saw her in the reflection again. I turned around to see if someone was there, and there was no one. That made me uneasy, but I smiled and thought this was going to be a good trip. Even if I didn't experience another thing the whole trip, that was worth it. Well, that didn't stop there. Later that night, I was getting ready to go out to dinner. My bathroom light came on, all by itself. And no joke, it looked like there was a shadow being cased onto the floor, coming out of the bathroom. I walked over and looked in, and couldn't find a reason for the shadow, which I was now standing on. Well, I quickly finished getting ready and went to dinner. I needed a drink. At dinner, my client asked how I liked the manger, and I told him I loved it. He asked if I had seen any shadows without people attached to them. I told him about the mirror woman, but not the shadow in the bathroom. I wanted to figure that one out first. I got back to my room, and the light was off in the bathroom. As I walked by, I said thank you for turning it off, half joking. I put my stuff down and returned to the bathroom and turned the light on. No shadow. I tried some different things to make it happen, but nothing close. And all I kept thinking was there was a ghost laughing his ass off, watching me try and figure it out. The night finished out quietly, and except for the shadows under the door that I just took as people walking by quietly, nothing else was worth talking about. The next trip ramped up a bit. When I checked in this time, I asked if I could have the same side that I had the last time, and they gave me one that I could look right out over the Alamo courtyard. That was cool. So this time, I had a bit more time, because it was an install. It started off boring the first day. That night, decided to go take the ghost tour of downtown. But first off, the Fuddrockers, yay. The next day, nothing during the day, and then I went to dinner. As I came back, there was a tour going on in the hotel, but I was tired from the day. I went to bed after watching some TV, and a couple of hours later, there was a bright light coming from outside. I had forgotten to close the curtains before I went to bed. As I was closing them, I noticed that the light was a street light across the way, and under was this little gate, and in front of the gate, there was a person standing there. And I noticed that it looked like a monk, or someone in a long robe and a hood. What was odd was that I could see through him, in areas like wherever the light hit him, the shadow areas, he looked as real as anything. I watched him for a moment, just to make sure he wasn't just some dude, and when I finally was like, get your phone, I reach over, and when I came back, there was nothing there, and a person was walking by. I felt bummed out and went back to bed. The next night was my last night for this trip, and did the normal dinner and drinks with the client and then to bed. Had an early flight, so wanted some sleep. As I walked down my hallway, I saw a shadow banking off the wall. I walked down the hallway after looking at it for a moment, because the problem is that there is no light source or door there. There is no reason for there to have a shadow of a person on that wall. 
It's like a light from a room was behind a person, and it cast a shadow on the wall, opposite of the room, just that there isn't a room there, or even a light source. As I got closer, it just disappeared, like someone closed the door. I went over and looked around for the light source, or something like that, but couldn't find anything that would do the trick. So I walked back to my room. As I got to the door, I saw a shadow under the door pass by, like if someone was under it. I opened it, half expecting someone to jump me from behind the door, but nothing. I finished the night without any more surprises and left with some interesting stories. The latest trip was weird. I was on the other side of the hotel, the original part, and was coming to my room after a meeting when I thought I almost ran into someone coming out of my room. I pivoted back to miss them, but when I looked to see who I almost hit, there wasn't anyone there or in the area. When I finally got into my room, my bed was made. Quick note about me, I dislike my sheets tucked in. What made me a bit upset was the fact that I had put the do not disturb sign on the door. I called down to the desk to ask why someone felt they needed to clean my room when I asked for it not to be. They said they hadn't started cleaning yet. I told them someone was just there, and I almost ran into them. The nice guy behind the desk on the phone said, Oh, you just met Sally. He apologized for her overexcited work ethic. However, let me know there isn't anything they can do to stop her from doing her job, because she's a ghost. We both laughed and hung up, and then I asked Sally if she was going to make the bed again, please don't tuck the sheet in. That night, I was sleeping, and I kept feeling a cold breeze on my feet, like the sheet was being lifted off my feet. I kept moving my feet to put them back under the covers, but kept feeling the breeze. Finally, I sat up and said, okay, I get it, that's why you tuck them in. After that, I think she let me be. The next day, I was flying out, and I left a tip and a note that said, Sorry, Sally, I didn't understand the importance of the sheet tuck. Thank you for all the hard work you do. I got an email from the hotel thanking me for the note to Sally. Apparently, she gets a lot of thank you notes. The Second Encounter Let me start out by saying that I'm no stranger to potentially haunted places. My grandma loved to tell us ghost stories when we were younger, which was only exaggerated by the fact that her house was, without a doubt, haunted. That's a story for another day, though. And, being as we grew up there, we usually just tried to reason and come up with an explanation of why weird things would happen at her house, usually leading to us ignoring whatever happened. The things that happened at the manger, however, were hard for us to explain away, and we usually say that was our first, true experience of the paranormal. Our family usually goes on one big family vacation a year, but we try to take two or three small weekend trips a year as well. One place we go almost every year is San Antonio, Texas. This particular visit happened about 10 years ago. Our typical hotel on the Riverwalk happened to be booked on this visit. So, my mom researched popular hotels, and, knowing my dad is a history buff, chose the manger for its location across from the Alamo and the history of the hotel. This hotel was built in the 1800s and hosted many famous people throughout the history. Unknowingly to us, at the time, it's also famous for being one of the most haunted hotels in Texas. Fast forward to the weekend of the trip. We arrived late and decided to check in, eat dinner, and then go to bed, so we could wake up early and enjoy a full day while rested. We had two adjoining double queen rooms, and my brother and sister-in-law were rooming with my other brother and my parents. Two nieces and me were in the other room. Nothing very eventful happened that first night, aside from what sounded like the scraping and banging of furniture being moved quite loudly in the room next to us. We just assumed people were staying in that room 
which we found at the end of our stay that there were not, and ignored it. My nieces were two and three at the time, and the youngest did not sleep at all the first night. She kept waking up crying. Around 4.30 a.m., my dad and I are awake with the girls. The three-year-old was sleeping with me, and the two-year-old was sleeping between my parents. He goes to the bathroom, and when he comes out, he stops and stares back at the mirror. I asked what was wrong, and he said he turned the lights out, but that the middle part, which had no bulb, lit up. He assumed he accidentally hit another switch, but before he could reach up to check the light, it went out. He looked, and there was only one switch in the bathroom. He turned the lights on and off a few times, but couldn't get it to do it again. So he shrugged it off, maybe just being a weird reflection. At about 5 a.m., my mom wakes up, and we are just laying in bed when the two-year-old looks at the window and starts giggling. My parents and I just look confused, and they asked what was so funny. Mind you, we are on the fourth floor. The curtains are drawn shut, except for maybe a couple-inch gap where all you see is a pitch-black window. She starts waving her arm, saying, Come in, come in. Now, my dad will ensure that you know that this was not his finest moment, and he felt bad. But his first reaction was to push all but gently, but push nonetheless, this child backwards on the bed while hollering, No ma'am, don't you be inviting nothing into this room. My mom and I started laughing, as did both children. But scolding my dad for getting scared and pushing that poor baby, I decide to start getting ready for the day, so I take a shower and get dressed. Once I'm ready, I start to bathe my three-year-old niece. She keeps leaning out of the tub to look around me, but she's getting water all over the floor, so I tell her to stop, and she goes. But who is that little boy right there? While pointing at the cabinet under the sink, directly behind me, I'm telling you, I have never froze so quick in my life. I try to act like I misunderstood her and tell her there's no little boys, it's just her and her sister. She said, no, there's a little boy right there, again pointing in the same cabinet. When I tell you I felt like I got a bucket of ice water dumped on me in about 0.1 seconds, I have never been so scared. I started to slowly turn around but right before I see the cabinet, my mom comes busting through the door needing to use the restroom. I finished the bathroom in record speed and made my mom bathe the youngest. We spend most of the rest of the day walking around downtown and after lunch, we come back. So me, my parents, and one of my brothers can go to the Manger Bar and my brother and sister-in-law can take the girls up for their naps. We have our drink, and go back up about 45 minutes later and our adjoining door is shut. We asked my brother why and he said that his wife and the youngest were taking a nap and that the oldest was playing toys while he played video games. He looked up and saw a shadow pass on our side of the room that looked like a person. He just assumed it was us, so ignored it. But my oldest niece jumped up saying she had to go potty. He said it took him a second, but he realized that she passed up their bathroom and ran to our room. He paused his game to go check on her, and when he found her, she had opened the cabinet under the sink and was halfway in and giggling. He told her to get out of there and asked why she came in there, and he said she stopped and sat back looking sad and goes, Daddy, you scared away the little boy. He freaked and made her come back to their room and shut the door. Y'all, we hadn't even had a chance to tell him about what happened that morning since they slept in, so he had no idea about the little boy from the bath, and when he found out, he really freaked out. There were several other little things, and I could tell y'all several stories that I've heard from people down there about their personal experiences, but perhaps the most scary for us happens that evening after the second sighting of the little boy. My brother and sister-in-law went to explore on their own. My other brother was taking a nap. My parents, nieces and I, were walking around the hotel, looking at everything. 
we decided we needed to fill up our ice chest with more ice, so we had to walk up to the ramp to the new part of the hotel and around a corner from our room. On the way up the ramp, my two-year-old niece fell down. She got up and kept walking, and it was fine. On the way back to the room, the oldest was running a few feet up, turning around and doing this big, over-exaggerated wave at us, like motioning us to her, and then repeating it, just being silly. I decided to record her while holding my youngest niece's hand. When we got to the ramp, in almost the same spot as she fell before, I told my youngest niece, don't fall down. Nothing was said after that, and it was only the five of us in the hallway. My parents, the two girls, and me. We get back to the room, and my brother and sister-in-law are there. I play the video for them so they can see how cute and silly the oldest was being. However, right after I say, don't fall down, this creepy voice says, plain as day, she's too late. We all stop and look at each other, and my brother goes, who said that? We told him, no one did. None of us said anything, and there was no one else in the hall with us. My only comfort in catching a ghost voice was, at least it was a sarcastic ghost with a sense of humor. At least, that's how we took it. That brings me to the end of this episode. Thanks for listening to The Dead Podcast. Please follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Dead Podcast. Also, feel free to send in your stories, episode suggestions, or feedback at thedeadpodcast1 at gmail.com or send me a DM on Instagram. Also, be sure to check out The Dead Podcast merch. The link is in the show notes. If you enjoyed this show, please rate and review the podcast on whatever platform you are listening on, and be sure to come back next week for my next episode.